Welcome to one more module concerned with dysmorphology basics. Before we begin, I'd like to point out the nuance separating prolegomenon from prolog or preface. Prolegon implies an introductory discussion of the subject on hand, while prolog or preface is the description of the contents, an orientation to the contents. Here we are going to talk about a patient that has a midline anomaly or median anomaly. And what we want to underscore as a prolegomenon that any anomalies of the midline facial or otherwise, like in the abdomen, is an omphalocele are of extreme importance and that should be viewed with great suspicion and alarm. So here, this presentation concerns a little girl and there is a short story here and I suggest you come back and read the printed aspects of this presentation with care, but first listen and see. In essence, the mother insists that this girl had a co-twin that wasn't born, that vanished, that disappeared. It's called the vanishing twin syndrome. So there is an ideal, <coughs> because ideally the clinical examiner should be unbiased, should not have preconceptions, should not be looking for one disease or another or one diagnosis or another, should examine the baby, as in this instance, without any particular loyalty to a point of view. So you are ready to view the video and record what you see, write it down so you can compare it with what we will be describing in the video. <coughs> and now that uh, we are back and you have seen the video, I like to make a point about the medical history. Very often that is called anamnesis. Ana, like in anatomy, implies cutting off, separating, in this case obtaining something from the patient, taking it from the patient to you, to your medical history. Amnesis means to remember, to induce the patient to remember. Where did it hurt? How badly did it hurt? How long did it hurt? What made it better or worse? The muse of memory is mnemosine, which stands for me more re. So mnemosine then is the source of the anamnesis and you should practice because it is an art to obtain information and why? Because anamnesis contains very valuable signs. Contrary to veterinary medicine much of the diagnosis and treatment of patients depends on the anamnesis. So in this instance, the anamnesis gave us one major sign, as I mentioned already, that there is a vanished twin. And we will learn a lot about it because vanished twins cause damage to the surviving twin. Read the text in these frames when you review the video again. It is short and you should review it again. <coughs> Our physical examination, that is examining material, concrete structures of the patient, such as the external developmental features, called our attention that she's very tiny and that her head is also small. So we think she has microsomatic dwarfism, if you like, but actually the correct term is midget but both are offensive, so we just say that she is a small person with even a smaller head that is microcephalic. But all of that is worthless, has no value unless we measure it. Likewise, we think that the ears appear large, but unless we measure them and put them in a gross chart, we should be careful 
because we may be wrong. <coughs> and a third domain of science is her behavior. She does not behave normally for a child of her age. <coughs> this page does not require comment. You should read it. I only will underscore that an empty brain cannot transform a sign into a signal. An empty brain cannot interpret. So please read this and try to memorize it since it is applicable to many, many circumstances. And then to continue with this line of thinking, we here stress the fact that there is such a thing like a holoprosencephaly complex. It is a complex of midline or median facial anomalies, such as microcephaly, cyclops, proboscis, a single nares or opening of the nose, lack of nasal septum, lack of the mid portion of the upper lip, etc. These signs are characteristic of the holoprosencephaly complex. And this complex, in turn, may be caused by Patau syndrome or trisomy 13. But it may be isolated. The way you distinguish that is that the holoprosencephaly complex, if associated with other midline anomalies, such as an omphalocele, is far more likely to be due to Patau syndrome than some other condition. All of it is a reflection of a failure of the prosencephalon to divide into two frontal lobes, create a, a corpus callosum, etc. Read this. This is not a place to discuss it further. But it is a place to call your attention to the SMMCI syndrome, which is relatively recently recognized, and clinicians that describe these patients led the molecular geneticist to discover an association with a gene mutation with a locus on the 7q36 area. So here we have one more potential pathogenesis, trisomy 13, anomalies of the chromosome 13 or anomalies of the chromosome 7q. In any case, signs are reality, signals are elaborations, hypotheses, so stick with reality, because if you don't start with reality, you don't go anywhere. I suggest that because the vanished twin can damage the surviving twin and even be the cause of this child's problems, the mechanism usually is vascular. So you should see a world-class salient presentation by Dr. Ken Jones, who speaks on the intrauterine vascular disruption as a cause of birth defects brilliantly, and you should know this, again, because these issues are common. I like to stress here one issue. Many clinicians and leaders of medical education think that this morphology is esoteric. That is, it's not important, it's not practical, it is just some sidekick or some uh, irrelevant interest, but in fact they are terribly wrong. This syndrome is one of the many examples how someone who is proficient in this morphology identified similarities between a group of patients and that led to molecular genetic investigations that identified genes that otherwise remain undiscovered. The other direction of such possibility virtually does not work. It is very rarely that investigators of molecular structures or sequences or mutations or gene maps, this very rarely that they translate those studies that allow clinicians to identify clinical entities. So if the whole progress is mostly resting on the shoulders of this morphologist. 
and the growth of molecular embryology and molecular teratology is dependent upon them, then I think it's time for neonatologists to join in the effort of this morphologist. A neonatologist welcomes every baby to this earth if the baby is born in a civilized and advanced society. They should have open eyes. So I hope you no longer view this morphology as something esoteric. Please look the word esoteric so you will be more proficient with the use of your terminology. And thank you for your attention.